Well, good morning. Wow, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And on behalf of the men and women of both the Space Force and the Air Force, it's truly a, a, uh, a joy uh, to talk about a topic that's so near and dear to my heart. You know, as, as we talk about ISAM, much like they say there's no I in team, I think even though it's the perfect name for an extraordinarily important set of capabilities, I think uh, looking at this awesome and diverse and richly intellectual team of doers, I think we could also say that we, Sam, is absolutely appropriate because this is a whole of government engaged activity, but we together are going to get it done, and that's what we must do. So um, I would like to share some thoughts and perspectives from the United States Space Force on behalf of the Chief of Space Operations, General Saltzman, and our whole team. We also have Brigadier General Kristen Ponsenhag, and she leads our 45 uh, SLD, our Space Launch Delta, down at Patrick uh, Space Force Base. But, you know, that's really a wonderful nexus of where we bring our acquisition and operations together and responsive, uh, responsible for many of the topics uh, that we'll cover today. But this is a whole of, uh, a whole of Space Force uh, team effort, and I'll share exactly what that is. Well, you know, this crowd is certainly no stranger to the absolute criticality of space to our everyday way of life. I mean, right now it's about a $450 billion enterprise, and as we look at that, uh, you know, as you checked weather and you used your GPS to get here, and perhaps you filled up the car with uh, pay at the pump uh, banking time synced uh, with GPS, you, you realize first person the ubiquity of space in every part of our daily lives. But as we've seen, and today is day 622 of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, we're several weeks into the uh, Israeli uh, conflict, and, you know, as we look at uh, our modern security, our modern integrated deterrence and defense, space is so absolutely critical to that. And, you know, I think if we reflect on Ukraine and the lessons learned, you know, we had our first space war, if you will, in the Gulf, uh, in the Gulf War, but, you know, as we look at this, it's changed the future today forevermore. Because when we just say a couple of names like Starlink and Capella and Maxar and Umbra and Isai, these are the commercial capabilities that have been the David and Goliath level or the transforming set of insights that counter the narrative of false, uh, of, 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 of false and, and, and fake news. So we know that for the 21st century, our security and our prosperity are absolutely inter, 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 intertwined, linked, and they're dependent upon United States leadership in space. But we do so with our partners and allies. And so at the Space Force, our mission simply is to secure our nation's interest in, from, and to space. Simply put, that covers the entire waterfront from 100 kilometers up on out to infinity in a continually expanding area of responsibility. We organize, train, and equip, and we operate within that set of domains, and that's solely focused on protecting U.S. and allied and partnered interests in space. And so as we look at that, as we kick this off, we know from, from, from an absolute fundamental sense that technology is key to our economy, key to our security, and that we have to move quickly, and that the, the trophy for second place, if you will, to quote the Top Gun, is in a place that we really don't want to be because as we look at this, uh, now is the time to forge smart policy. And you'll hear from Esne uh, just, just following, and, it, and, it, and it's so wonderful to follow uh, such a visionary partner in, in Pam Melroy uh, and our NASA counterparts. You know, really, we see, uh, uh, you know, despite that we, that whole of government engagement, we see the Space Force and NASA as being the two really long poles in this, uh, this tent where we're having uh, uh, quite an expedition uh, under, underneath. And so as we, as, as, as we see our policy focused on the adoption of new technologies, uh, leveraging our market focused, broad and, and diverse and sustainable industrial base, plus uh, enabling all the ISAM capabilities, this is, uh, this is core to our future. And so when we talk about it, that future for the Space Force, our theory of success, the way we succeed, is really about staying in competitive endurance because we seek a safe, stable, secure and sustainable space domain so that we can have freedom of action within it. We can enable all the other services and capabilities because in the Space Force, we're really the most joint of all because we support every mission there is across the globe. And then finally, it gives our national leadership at all echelons uh, the ability to have choices and options. 
So as we look at that, we draw from U.S. national uh, policy. The U.S. Uh, national policy on in-space servicing assembly is, 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 of course, very relevant to what we're here talking about today. But I think the most important part of that pairing is the, actually the implementation plan. Because the implementation plan is actually doing and measuring and getting done, having OPRs and, 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 and primary responsibilities on a temporal time scale that keeps us all honest and has metrics to measure what matters. But you know, we drive that into our very doctrine documents, like the space power docu uh, doctrine, uh, and we call that in the military sense, space access, mobility, and launch, or SAML. And SAML is basically the movement and support of equipment personnel in, from, to, and through space domain. And what could be more important or core than that? And you see, whether it be orbital prime or whether it be our, 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 our Air Force Research Laboratory activities or whether it be across our, our, our Space Development Agency, our Space Systems Command, uh, our, our Space Rapid Capabilities Office, or any of our acquisition elements tied integrally to our operations, our tactics, techniques, and training, doctrine, test, all the portfolio is engaged. Because you know we realize um, in the Space Force that it is a contested and congested and competitive environment. So we're focused on three things. The three things that we do and focus that mission on in the Space Force are to build combat capable and ready forces so that we can be a deterrent force and a defensive force for our nation. We build on our, 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 our guardian ideal, our, our, our amplifying our guardian spirit, which is courage, character, commitment, and connection. And when we talk about that connection that ties directly into the third line of effort, which is partner to win. And that is why we are here today. Because that's partnering, as I mentioned, with only 16,500 people, partnering to win is core to what we do. It is partnering to win with industry, partnering to win with the interagency, partnering to win with our institutional and academia uh, elements, because there's so much to do, discover, learn, and apply. And then finally, internationally, we know that we are always stronger with internationals. So we, 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 we bring that in a steady cadence. This is only our fourth year of existence when we come up on our fourth birthday on 20 uh, December of this year. So we're out of the terrible twos. We're into the, you know, we're into the, uh, the really energetic phase, and I think that's so appropriate when we talk about SAML, our ISAM strategy for the Space Force, maneuvering in from, to, and through space because, you know, as we see, this can elevate our broad U.S. strategic capabilities and capacity. It expands our national infrastructure and logistics, and it ties and enhances uh, all of those elements that will lead to success in, in the security of our nation, its partners, and allies. And, you know, when we talk about the revolutionary and disruptive capabilities, let's just use Starship as an example. What Starship may provide for the nation is 100 metric tons to low Earth orbit. That's a C-17 to low Earth orbit, which is just transformatively disruptive for us. So here's what we will do with that. And it was said first and foremost, you know, right now, the ability to sustain maneuver, the ability to maneuver without regret will lead to dynamic space operations. And if you think about it, throughout history, we've learned very hard lessons. Maneuver and movement are key to survival. They're key to success. And in the past, since the dawn of the space area era, we've relied on satellites where Kepler and Newton have largely had us dependent on orbitology and, 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 and the natural uh, dynamics. But now we need to maneuver because of those congested and contested and ever-increasing threats. So sustained space maneuver is a fundamental imperative, not a nice to have, a fundamental imperative of the United States for, State Space Force and our mission to secure our nation's interests in, from, and to, and through. But also responsive launch, operationally responsive space, tactically responsive space, throughout the ecosystem, orbit repositioning, upgrading and repair. Um, these, are, these are very dual use capabilities as well. As we look at rendezvous and prox ops, uh, something that has been so fundamental to NASA's success, uh, so too it's critical to everything that we do. In-flight refueling, on-orbit assembly and manufacturing. Uh, we're, we're looking not just at geosynchronous orbit and below, but ex-geo, cis-lunar, lunar environment, uh, looking as, as, as we develop our capability sets out to uh, asteroids and ultimately Mars. This is our long-term vision. I think 
uh, Pam absolutely nailed it. When we look at 10, 20 years down the line, this is not very far off. This is what our game plan is for space access, uh, access mobility and logistics in the 2030 timeframe. You know, as we look at that, we're also getting beyond the tyranny of the fairing, driving to, to leverage the capabilities of in-space manufacturing and, and in-situ materials. When we look at that, things what we used to laugh about in terms of space solar power, we've now proven through diligent risk reduction every single constituent technology for space solar power. And talk about a transformative capability that can lend so many uh, positive attributes to our operations and to our, uh, to our security. That is now where we stand today. I'm a big proponent, and I think that has multiple uh, capabilities that will benefit us all. And so, you know, as we look at this, as we look at the inextricable tie between economy and security, when we look ahead for US allied and a partner prosperity and protection, Certainly, we have the Blue Water Space Force vision in the long term out to cislunar and beyond, and the Brown Water Space Force, if you will, to, to, to uh, uh, make sure that we are addressing our prioritized needs and activities in geosynchronous orbit and below. Together, it's all about a hybrid space architecture, partnering, leveraging and focusing on ISAM in a WESAM type of approach where a whole of government engagement is exactly what we're focused on. And so with that, I'm very thankful to be here. Uh, I, I look forward, I, I, I've eaten all my time, but I will be here uh, till uh, the early part of the afternoon and I look forward to connecting with all of you. Thank you very much.